by knowing where the sun is relative to the earth, where the moon is relative to the earth, and where the moon is relative between the two. A solar eclipse happens when the moon is directly in between the earth and the sun. This causes the moon to cast a shadow onto the earth, creating a spectacle like no other. O3 is ozone. High up in the stratosphere, it's made naturally and absorbs harmful ultraviolet rays from the sun. Without it, life as we know it wouldn't, couldn't exist. We need the ozone layer in the stratosphere. We want it, we rely on it. Here is one example of the data that we get called a sounding. As the balloon rises, we pay careful attention to the temperature, where it is warmer to the right and colder to the left. The air temperature is the red line and the dew point is the green line. The dew point is a way of measuring the humidity and the difference between the two lines tells us where the air is dry versus where the air is saturated. As you can imagine, it is normal to expect that the higher you go, the colder it gets, which is what we can see in this graph. It's interesting to note, however, that really high up, it begins to get warmer again once you enter the stratosphere. You see, we are particularly lucky here on Earth because the moon's diameter is 400 times smaller than the sun's, but it's also 400 times closer to the Earth, making them appear almost the same size in the sky. That allows us to get a look at the sun's corona. Sometimes we think of astronauts jetting up into cold, dark space, leaving our atmosphere behind. But the Earth actually lives in the sun's atmosphere. Energetic particles shoot out from the sun and get deflected by the Earth's magnetic field. That's what keeps us safe and makes those beautiful auroras at the Earth's poles. But the sun also produces coronal mass ejections, or CMEs. A big one can disrupt our magnetic field, interfere with satellites, communications, and in rare cases, even shut down power grids. We've even discovered solar cycles. How much water seeps into the ground depends on the type of soil, how absorbent it is, and how much water is already in the soil. Where do these observations come from? Surface data comes from weather stations over land and buoys over the ocean. Observations at upper levels comes from radars, satellites, and aircrafts. But the most important source of upper air observations comes from weather balloons. Here is another example that many in Colorado know as the brown cloud, called an inversion. Here you can see at the beginning of the launch, near the surface, it's actually getting warmer as it rises. Then we can see where it immediately gets colder. This is where the colder layer of smog is trapped below the warmer air above. Jennifer lives in a watershed that flows into a nearby stream. That watershed, along with neighboring watersheds, make up an even bigger watershed, made up of other neighboring watersheds that make up an even bigger watershed. You see how this could be pretty confusing, but luckily we have an easy way to classify watersheds. We use HUCs, or Hydrological Unit Codes, which is just the fancy name we use for a watershed address. Think of it like a jigsaw puzzle. The first number represents one piece of a puzzle made up with relatively few pieces. The second number represents a more complex puzzle with even more pieces. You can keep breaking up the puzzle into more and more pieces until you get your full address. This is Jennifer's address. 